Great. Uh, well, uh, hi, everybody, um, and welcome to the uh, CNTN Virtual Research Symposium. Um, you know, we've been doing these periodically uh, throughout the year and what has obviously been a tough more than a year at this point. So I'm really glad that we we're able to get some turnout. Um, before I start, I would like to begin by acknowledging that I am in Mi'kma'ki, the traditional unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people, in the spirit of of the historic peace and friendship treaties, I want to acknowledge that we are all treaty people. And um, just before we get started, um, I just a, a little bit of um, housekeeping to go through. Um, first thing I'd like to do is introduce uh, Hans Borster. Um, you know, Hans and I have been at this together with Alicia for quite some time. He is the patient co-lead uh, of the CNTN along uh, with me of the scientific committee. And uh, he'll really be doing a lot of the heavy lifting during this talk in terms of making sure we're doing things and keeping on time as well as Alicia. Um, I do wanna remind everybody that we do have patient partners on this call. And so please use patient uh, accessible language throughout your presentations. Um, briefly with the agenda, we have three very exciting uh, presentations to hear from. Um, I'm gonna let each speaker introduce their topic, but we're gonna hear uh, from Kristen Clements uh, about a proposal regarding denosumab and fragility fractures in dialysis. Um, I believe we're gonna follow that up with a uh, presentation by uh, Mayaliza Donald and Dwight Sparks on My Kidneys, My Health website, developed by patients for patients. And then we're gonna close with um, Melissa Shore presenting on diuretic use with residual, in patients with residual kidney function on hemodialysis. And um, uh, really nothing else for me to say at this point, very excited for the turnout. Uh, please be sure to um, ask any questions in the chat during the talk and um, make sure you put those questions in there and afterward we'll make sure that we collect and collate them so that um, we can ask the presenters uh, while we're, or after their presentations are concluded. Um, so thank you very much. And I think at this point, I'll um, hand it over to Hans. Well, thank you, Carly. Um, I'd like to start as well with uh, the land acknowledgement. Uh, oh, wait a minute. It, uh, was Mary not going to do? Yeah, it's, sorry. It's 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 uh, over to Mary and then and then to Hans. Yeah. My, my, my mistake, yeah. Mary first, <laughs> Mary first and then Hans. <laughs> Sorry, Mary. <laughs> I was so excited with all your help that I forgot to mention you. <laughs> Thanks, Karthik. Mary Bokas, News to Cause. Nabi Singh Robinson here on Treaty Lunjaba. My name is Mary Bokas. I'm Anish Nevekwe from Robinson for, uh, from Nipsing First Nation and Robinson here on Treaty Territory in Northeastern Ontario. This is part of the territory my ancestors worked, lived, and played on, and I'm honored to call it my home. The area is a long established crossroads for all directions coming to trade and participate in ceremony. I want to share my appreciation and respect to the elders in my community, past, present, and emerging. I would also like to acknowledge and thank the Musqueam, Tsleil-Waututh, and Squamish nations for allowing us to live, work, and grow on their unceded territories. The Cansolve CKD Vancouver headquarters is located there. The Coast Salish people have existed for over 10,000 years along the Northwest coast of North America and have a beautiful history. Their spiritual traditions were deeply involved in the relationship to spirit, including ancestors, guiding spirits and animal spirits. I recognize those that have settled across Turtle Island throughout time and have committed to making it their home. And I welcome you from the territories that you are rooted in. Jim McGuire. Thank you, Mary. <clears throat> I'd like to follow up on that with uh, my own land acknowledgement. Uh, I'm Hans Forster. I live in what is known as Kingston, Ontario, which is uh, in the Cataraqui region and is the traditional home of the uh, Anishinaabe, uh, Haudenosaunee Confederation, and the Huron Wendat peoples. I'm uh, uh, going to be introducing the um, 
speakers and uh, hosting the discussions this morning. And each we're having, as as Karthik has mentioned, uh, three different uh, topics. Um, I will introduce each individually. Uh, I uh, we will have questions on each of those uh, topics at the end of the presentation of each end of the presentation. So there will be three question periods, and then probably four for people who have either come later or have general questions that may not be necessarily answered by a single uh, uh, respondent. Anyway, uh, it's, um, uh, it's going to be an interesting couple of hours. Uh, you, you've heard that we are going to talk about uh, fractures in urine and CKD patients. Uh, and an interesting addition to the toolkit for patients, uh, website uh, for patients and by patients. I think it's, uh, uh, it's going to be this, think, an interesting couple of hours. And I'd like to start today uh, by presenting or introducing Dr. Kristen Clemens, who's an endocrinologist at St. Joseph Healthcare in London, Ontario, where I presume it is also snowing. Um, but it certainly is here. Uh, and um, uh, she is going to talk about a proposed study of uh, denosumab uh, for the prevention of fragility fractures in hemodialysis. Dr. Clements, over to you. Thank you so much for the introduction and I uh, really appreciate the opportunity to share um, this project with you today. So you can go to the next slide. So I'm gonna speak with you about a trial that we'll be advancing called the preferred um, trial. And next slide, please. So fragility fractures have significant consequences for patients. These fractures, which occur at a standing height or less, lead to pain, um, decreased mobility, physician visits, hospitalization, and they've even been associated with death. And if you can advance to the next slide. This is a recent study that used uh, data from um, people in Ontario that suggested that the risk of mortality more than doubled within the first year following a fracture and that the likelihood of survival was even impacted within five years after of a fracture. And next slide, please. Um, we also know that fractures uh, are associated with very high healthcare costs. And this is another study um, from Ontario that suggested that the average total direct healthcare costs, so costs related to medical visits and hospitalizations per individual in the first year following fracture was about $40,000 um, with the risk substantially uh, high for, for uh, vertebral fracture as well as hip fracture. Next slide, please. Unfortunately, the risk and consequences of fragility fracture are especially profound in people who are using hemodialysis. We know that these patients in particular have a fragility fracture risk that is at least five times greater than those who do not have kidney disease. And once they have had a fracture, they unfortunately face greater lengths of hospital stay, as well as a twofold increase in in-hospital mortality. And unfortunately, how to best prevent fracture in this group of patients is very uncertain. And that's because many of the drugs that we would use to prevent fracture in people with normal kidneys either can't be used in dialysis, are associated with side effects. And we also know that people using dialysis have very complex bone disease that impacts their fracture risk. Next slide. So denosumab or prolia is a medication that has been around for many years, um, used um, uh, very substantially in countries like Canada and elsewhere. And we know from clinical trials of people with normal kidneys that it's very uh, effective in preventing fracture. So this medication reduces the risk of uh, back fractures, also known as vertebral fractures by 70%, hip fractures by 40%, and then non-back fractures, which basically is wrist fractures by about 20%. And because the drug's action and its breakdown aren't dependent on the kidneys, it is currently approved by Health Canada for use in people with kidney disease, including those um, on hemo and peritoneal dialysis. And it is covered by uh, most uh, provincial drug benefits programs. Next slide. 
Unfortunately, however, studies of denosumab in people on hemodialysis are limited. The literature that we have to date um, is really focused on studies which were observational, um, very small samples of people included. Many did not have a, a comparison group. And they mainly focused on the effect of denosumab on the mineral content of bone that you can see depicted by those pictures on the right hand side of the slide, rather than bone fractures, which is what most um, patients and providers are, are concerned about. Next slide. Like all drugs, denosumab can have side effects and low calcium has been reported in those with kidney disease, mainly in, in case reports and small case series. But importantly, there have been risk factors identified for um, hypocalcemia or low calcium, and that is both low and high bone turnover, low vitamin D and calcium levels even before giving the drug, as well as a lack of supplementation with vitamin D and calcium during drug treatment. Next slide. So preventing fractures in renal disease or preferred will be a randomized controlled trial of denosumab in people on hemodialysis. And we will integrate this trial into routine dialysis care and focus it on important fracture outcomes. And the intervention will not only include um, in-unit administration of denosumab, so denosumab administered in the dialysis unit, but selection of the right patient to receive the drug um, protocol guided calcium and vitamin D prophylaxis to try to reduce the risk of a low calcium, as well as very close calcium monitoring that can be facilitated in the dialysis unit. Next slide, please. So before we conduct a large trial, we'll be advancing a pilot study um, focused in Ontario. Um, and our objectives are to examine adherence with the trial protocol. Um, to examine how well people uh, stay on denosumab or their adherence to the drug, and then to do some exploration of the safety and, and efficacy of the intervention. And our hope is that we can randomly um, allocate or uh, recruit um, 60 people across six hemodialysis centers in our province within three months. And we'd like to demonstrate greater than 90% adherence to help us to tell whether a larger trial will be feasible. Next slide. So this is just a schematic of, of what we're envisioning um, preferred one to look like. So we've kept the in inclusion exclusion criteria um, general to, so as to try to include um, a, a, a larger population of patients that are normally seen in dialysis and in our uh, metabolic bone disease clinics. So we'll include those 40 years and older who are using in-center hemodialysis who have access to provincial drug benefits. We like to include those who have um, some of their bone markers that are in within a target range um, to administer the drug. And we will include those who are already at a high risk of having a fracture. So those are people who have at least a 20% risk of having a fracture of the back, the spine or the wrist over about a 10 year period. And there are some exclusion criteria here at the bottom. So we, we, we really would like to restrict to people who we think will be using dialysis chronically for more than six months. And then we would exclude people already receiving another medication for fracture prevention or Sinicalcet, or those who've had an allergy um, to denosumab or an intolerance to denosumab. And then patients will be randomized one-to-one -to, -one to our intervention arm versus usual care. And we'll follow them for, for 15 months for this pilot study. And then our primary, um, our primary outcomes here will be our feasibility outcomes that I spoke about earlier. And we hope that these will be uh, captured using um, really easy bedside data uh, collection forms. And then we'll collect our secondary um, safety and efficacy endpoints from ICES, which as, uh, as you might know, uh, holds one of the world's largest collections of um, uh, databases that contain administrative health data. So every time someone sees a doctor or is admitted to hospital for fracture, et cetera, this information is, is captured um, and accessible um, as uh, ICS scientists. Next slide. Um, and then the last piece here is that we are going to use remote participant recruitment and consent. And so we'll try to keep this as streamlined as possible. 
And so uh, what our hope is that our, our unit will be able to screen for patients by age. And then our, um, our nephrology colleagues or nurse practitioners maybe help to uh, identify those who are expected to continue with in-center hemodialysis. And then this group of patients will be approached to watch uh, an educational recruitment video on an e-platform um, accessible on an iPad. And then within this e-platform, um, patients, if they're interested after watching our video, they can complete an extra few recruitment questions and we'll have a link to our um, consent uh, form um, if the study is of interest to them. And then back at our central site, um, our re uh, research assistants will help confirm eligibility and then perform um, randomization. And next slide. So the significance of this study, again, are that, um, as we're all well aware, people on dialysis are frequently excluded from research studies. And as such, it's, it's unclear how to best prevent fragility fracture safely in this very high risk group of people. We hope that this study will uh, provide evidence to optimize bone health and hemodialysis, and it's designed to try to be relevant to real world patients and providers. And my uh, next slide. And I just wanted to say thank you to uh, our uh, network of co-investigators, our patient partner, Mrs. Bonnie Fields, uh, the trainees uh, involved in the, our work and our, um, our funders and supporters. And I thank you again kindly for allowing me to present to you. Hans, you're still, um, you're still muted, Hans. I do. There we go. I didn't mute myself, so uh, <laughs> some little fairy did, uh, came in and muted me. Um, you know, as I said, thank you very much. For, it, was, uh, a, uh, it was very interesting. Um, uh, there's a couple of questions. Can you see them, Hans, in yeah, the chat I was, there? I was just looking at them. I'm just, okay. There was uh, uh, one from uh, Heather uh, who says, um, uh, what platform is being used for the e-consent? So we're exploring that right now, but we, um, we will likely use RedCap, which has a template for e-consent and also allows for embedding videos, uh, patient handouts and additional recruitment questions. So that's the platform that we're planning to use at this point. Um, any follow up to that from you, Heather? No, she's not there. Um, from Nancy, there is a question, uh, what is the criteria for determining what patients, oops, I just took a, what patient, uh, sorry, determining that patients that are, are at high risks for fragility fractures? Okay. So uh, high risk for fragility fracture can be determined um, based on one's fracture history. So um, if someone has had a previous hip fracture or back fracture, they're automatically um, uh, defined as someone who's high risk. And moreover, if someone's had uh, more than two fractures, then they're also considered to be high risk. So that will be self-reported uh, by the potential participant. Um, we also plan to incorporate um, the uh, FRAX uh, question. So FRAX is basically a, an online validated clinical tool where you enter simple data that would be available um, either at the bedside or by patient, um, patient self-report that includes their age and their weight. And it will help to establish a, a risk of fracture for that patient as well. Um, we know uh, that uh, people using dialysis and that have kidney disease are also at higher risk. So we'll use, we'll use the combination again of both their fracture history, as well as this FRAX online tool that we'll be able to embed with our questions um, in the e-platform. E, uh, e Anything you want to ask as a follow-up, uh, Nancy? Thank you very much for that. That was quite helpful. Um, so in essence that we're looking at, can it make a difference from someone that's already had fractures versus someone that has not had fractures prior to this study? 
Yeah, it's a great question. So I am focusing in on high risk people because we know these high risk people are the ones that we really want to protect and really want to investigate the utility of the drug. So that's where my focus is. Um, in, in, the, in our clinical practice guidelines, we tend to offer treatment for someone in a medium or high risk group rather than a lower risk group. So um, this will help not only to try to get the answers that are needed for these individuals, um, but then also, you know, this is not a drug without, without side effects. And so I think if we're going to um, study it, we really want to make sure that the risk and, and, um, and side effects uh, balance in the right direction. I do have one last comment, and that's the um, the atypical fractures we've seen in the bisphosphonates. And I noticed that you're not including that group, uh, but it's an awkward situation to be in that having been one of those recipients. Um, are we looking for a balance in, in trying to use typical osteoporosis drugs uh, in prevention from that angle versus something like the drug you're looking at now? Yeah, so absolutely. So atypical femoral fractures are, are very rare, but uh, if you experience one, then, then, then rightly so to be very concerned about it. Um, I think that you make an excellent point. We should definitely exclude people who have had an atypical femoral fracture. Um, we may have to figure out how to best ask that question. I think people could identify maybe having a fracture of their thigh, but the difficult part there is that sometimes thigh fractures can be related to osteoporosis as well. So again, I, I appreciate that, uh, that comment and I'll, I'll think through that, but we should, we should exclude people who've previously had an atypical fracture. Thank you, appreciate it. Okay, uh, next question comes from Tyrone Gordon Harrison, who, uh, uh, which is, Will there be an option for non-electronic uh, non consent for less fixed dialysis patients? Yeah, absolutely. So what we'll plan to do is we'll send uh, paper copies of our letter of information and consent uh, form um, to the units that are interested in participating as well. And we, can, we will absolutely um, include the option to have verbal uh, consent with written signature and then have those documents uh, sent back to our central site. I know that uh, technology is not for, for everyone and there's always the possibility of glitches with technology as well and internet connection. So um, we'll have to have a, a backup plan for sure. Right. Um, do you have any follow-up to that, uh, Tyrone, if, uh, if you're listening? Any other questions that you have for this? Or any follow-up to this one? No? Okay. <laughs> Are there any other questions from the floor for? Uh, There's a Dr. few more in the chat here. Sorry? There's a few more in the chat here. Karthik asks, any thought to more? allowing- did I, oh, did I miss a couple? There's a flurry of, of questions actually for Kristen. Um, any thought to allowing those on osteoporosis drugs to be included? Messages, it says in the bottom, okay. <laughs> provided to, uh, provided it's held for a period of time prior to study initiation. Yeah, I think if they're receiving active osteoporosis medications, then we should not include them. But if they've received osteoporosis medications in the past year um, and are not using it at the time of randomization, I think that would be okay. Because that's really what we might be doing in clinical practice is transitioning maybe someone off a drug onto denosumab. So we, we, we will allow these people to enter the study as well. Um, do you see the other ones there? There's one from David. Yeah, I got one here from okay. uh, so Karthik. Is, it, that wasn't good. Karthik, but no. Um, a, a few questions from uh, uh, from Karthik, apparently. Um, uh, a few questions. Any thought to allowing those on osteoporosis? Oh, we did that one. It's the next oh, one. That's the one you just did, isn't it? Yeah. All right, yeah, okay. Excuse me for... Uh, I was reading other ones and there's a flurry of questions listening to what you had to say. Um, from David Collister. Uh, he apologizes for being late. Uh, but is FRAX being used uh, uh, bone biopsy to uh, exclude dynamic bone disease 
and safety monitoring for hypocalcemia. Hypocal yeah, so with respect to adynamic bone disease, it's an excellent point. Unfortunately, we won't have access to bone biopsy and we know that, that most centers don't, including um, community centers. So what we're going to do is we'll, we'll try to rely on bone biochemistry. I know it's not ideal, but there have been some su studies suggesting that looking at things like the ALP and the parathyroid hormone might be helpful to exclude a dynamic bone disease. And so that's why we've tried to restrict to people who we feel have an in-target um, bone markers um, uh, to include them in this study. Uh, in terms of the uh, safety monitoring for hypocalcemia, so as mentioned, so we have a, a protocol and the protocol is meant to uh, be a guide. Um, so allow uh, nephrologists or nurse practitioners um, to help uh, monitor patients and, and treat um, their calcium if, uh, if it does uh, change. So what we're going to do is we're going to suggest that the units check um, calcium every time patients are already in the unit for having a dialysis uh, session for the first two weeks uh, after the drug is given and then thereafter weekly. And then from that moment on, so at about the fifth, fifth week after the injection, which again is only every six months, they'll continue with their routine um, hemodialysis blood work which uh, tends to include calcium and albumin in, in some uh, centers, PTH. Um, what we have in the protocol as well is after their, their proli injection, we have some suggestions for use of IV calcitriol, which they could receive during dialysis treatments again, um, as well as adjustment of the calcium dialysate so that we're not having to uh, have patients have to take extra pills or remember to take extra drugs to try to, um, to, try to keep their, their calcium in a, in a good safe range. We're having this administered in the dialysis unit when they're already there alongside uh, the blood work. Um, and again, it's, it's used as a guide. So not everyone is the same, but I think it will at least give um, our, our kidney staff uh, a little bit of um, more uh, clear understanding as to what, what could be used to help manage this patient um, while they're on the drug. Um, okay, were you David? Happy yeah, thanks so much. <laughs> Another one from Karthik. Uh, is the calcium threshold based on the risk of hypocalcemia? Why can't I say hypocalcemia? Not a hard word. Uh, hypocalcemia with a diagnosis uh, and corrected or uncorrected. Yeah, uh, so any thought of using ionized instead of, uh, or do you have concerns about feasibility cost with measuring ionized? calcium? Yeah, so we, we wanted to use tests that we knew were being done routinely anywhere and not having to um, not having to do extra tests in, in uh, individuals like an ionized calcium or a bone specific alkaline phosphatase. Uh, so we will use a corrected calcium, some albumin corrected calcium. I know that's controversial, but it's still suggested as a, as a reliable in this uh, patient population. And the criteria for the threshold of the 2.15, again, um, based on some studies that have looked at predictors for hypocalcemia, there have been small studies that have suggested that people who started the drug with a calcium less than 2.1 might do worse than those who start with a calcium greater than 2.1. So it's not uh, not a terribly big study or, 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 or anything to, to hang your hat on too much. Um, so what I did is just try to use the lower limit of normal and then also just then understanding that much lower than that might place them at more risk once they get the drug. Makes sense. Thanks. Uh, from Catherine Place. Uh, great to see a systematic approach to this problem. Uh, we don't know how best to manage metabolic bone disease in people with CKD and ESKD. Uh, and I'm wondering how you will manage practice variations uh, in this area. Um, excellent 
Excellent question. So I know I, I we didn't want to be too restrictive in a protocol, right? Every, medicine is an art, and especially in cases where we don't have, to have a lot of evidence as to what's best, clinicians make their own decisions and use their best judgment um, when, when managing calcium or hypocalcemia or, or providing drug. So again, what we've done is um, just provided a guide, um, particularly as to what might be appropriate for the first week after the drug. But then we're really going to, to leave it to, to the physicians um, to make the, the end of the day decision as to what they wanna use for supplementation. Um, and, uh, and same goes if the calcium drops. So we don't really want to tell investigators what they should do will provide some guidance. But I think that's what happens in, in the real world is that every clinician practices differently. And, and, um, uh, and so we need to consider that if we're trying to advance a, a trial that's relevant to the real world. Thank you. Um, from Newman Lu, what is the prevalence of uh, osteonecrosis of the jaw in dialysis patients receiving denosumab. Um, how would you evaluate this risk before starting this drug in your study? So the risk of osteonecrosis of the jaw over a two-year period in people and all comers is about one in 100,000. So a very rare risk. I don't know of kidney disease or dialysis being a specific risk factor for that rare outcome. We know that um, people who uh, maybe have not great dental hygiene, maybe don't see their dentist regularly, who smoke, who have cancer, who use steroids might be at a slightly higher risk of the outcome. Uh, however, on the balance of things, if we're uh, thinking about a significant fracture risk, we still feel that in the right patient, um, the, the, the benefits might succeed that rare risk. Um, so what we tend to do in practice and would be relevant to this trial as well is um, just make sure that people don't have any major dental surgeries coming up. So if they're going to go in for a root canal or have many teeth extracted or, you know, do have significant problems with their dentition, that that might be a risk factor. And so we'd have to evaluate whether that should uh, potentially exclude someone from receiving the drug. Right. Um, I now think, I think this is now the last question, at least on this list, from uh, Tyrone Gordon-Harris. At least in my province, Alberta, there is variability in PTH assay used in terms of normal range, etc. In Ontario, is this standardized? Just thinking of your inclusion criteria for PTH from 15 to 16, if I remember correctly. Yeah, I do recognize that it's, uh, it is variable um, and that it could change over time as well. Um, what I've tried to do is also include the alkaline phosphatase, recognizing that that one's a little bit more stable. It's not perfect because we'd be looking at all alkaline phosphatase rather than focus on the bone. Um, but it is certainly, uh, it, it is a limitation um, that there is variability in the PTH assay. Anything further from, uh, from Tehran? No? Anything for, now I can say, anything further from anyone else on the floor, uh, now is the time to ask your brother captain. Nope. Good, in that case, uh, Kristen Clemens, I thank you very kindly for, uh, for this uh, presentation is obviously interesting, lots of questions. Thank you very much. So thank you for coming and uh, speaking to us. Thank you. For the next presentation, uh, I would like to introduce, um, on, let me try this. Uh, Dr. Melissa, Melissa, uh, Donald, better known as Mo, 
small that he was doing. Um, uh, Donald from the University of Calgary and Dwight Sparks, uh, the, our, my cancel colleague that uh, is a patient of partner from St. John's Newfoundland, St. John no, Newfoundland, uh, will be presenting on the website of their team has developed, my kidneys, my health. Ca. And the website is an interactive tool that makes that provides guidance and supporting information to patients with chronic kidney disease and their caregivers. Uh, and I turn it over to uh, Dr. Mo. And thank you. Wait. Thank you, Hans. Uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, and thank you for inviting us, uh, myself and Dwight, to present at uh, the symposium today. And uh, um, I myself, as Hans mentioned, I'm uh, located in Calgary at the University of Calgary, and my co-presenter Dwight is uh, lives on the opposite side of uh, Canada in Newfoundland, and Dwight, as Hans mentioned, is a patient partner, and I've worked with uh, Dwight for the last uh, four years on this multi-phased uh, project. Next slide. So as I mentioned, this is a multi-phase project that has spanned, um, it is a cancel project that has spanned the last five going on six years. And it is uh, this website, just to give you some background, is informed by evidence and, uh, and guidelines and also input from experts such as dietitians, pharmacists, nephrologists, and other clinicians um, to inform the content of the website. And it was co-developed by patients and care partners from across Canada um, to address gaps in areas such as topic areas, timelines of information, timeliness of information. It has tailored tools that Dwight will um, talk about. And a key point is that it fills a gap that was identified by patients and those that care for them in terms of early stage CKD. Next slide. So I'm not going to go through the multiple phases that of work we have done, but uh, feel free to ask me questions after the presentation. But I am going to focus on the co-development um, phase of this work in terms of the methodologies. We worked with our research team of 18 colleagues um, from within Canada and also from Australia. And basically, we um, teamed up with a technology software firm to build this web website, and we um, considered three phases to the methodology in developing the website and the first part was the focus groups were used to create the website features and content so basically we had to understand what areas in terms of topics content content and features patients and caregivers were looking for in a website for early stage chronic kidney disease once we uh, created the basic content, we did focus groups um, to show people some features that, and um, functions of the website and understood that uh, to understand um, how that tailored interactive component could be integrated into the website. Once the website was um, developed in a very basic form, we did heuristic testing um, with patients and uh, external agents to um, test how the navigation worked, how the features worked, and how um, the overall presentation of the website looked. And then finally, we did a 60-minute 60 60 in-person um, interviews with usability testing with patients and caregivers. And what we found from those three uh, phases was that uh, the focus group participants that provided suggestions uh, wanted to inc incorporate to ensure that there was interactive tools and that the navigation was to be simple compared to other websites that they had experienced um, regarding um, looking for education and self-management support that are out there. The heuristic testing found that, uh, that we, um, we identified some basic navigation issues and that the functionality um, that needed to be addressed that was completed by our sof software um, team. And then finally, the usability um, to ensure that the different types of features in terms of um, videos and text and tailoring functionality um, was there and it received a high score of system usability of 90 out of 100. Next slide. So My Kidneys, My Health um, was a name that was, uh, um, we had a competition to name the website and that took place 
I think it was about two years ago at CanSolve, um, and that was CanSolve annual meeting, and this was the name that was uh, voted on, My Kidneys, My Health. Um, and now I'm gonna hand it over to, to, to Dwight, and he'll talk to, and highlight some of the features of the website. Yes, thanks, Mo. Um, I'm so thrilled and proud to be here today talking to you about My Kidneys, My, My Health. This work is why I got involved in research. I think back to uh, 2017 when I first joined uh, Cancel and I was given a list of uh, 18 projects to pick from. This one immediately caught my eye. I didn't know much about dialysis or transplant, but uh, self-management, well, I had been doing that for years. So it was a, an, an opportunity to pass along what I learned as a stage three CKD patient, and maybe uh, pick up a few tips myself. This pro pro project turned out to be much more though. This is because the research team went above and beyond to include um, patient partners in all phases of the project. From allowing patients uh, to set uh, priorities to gathering requirements uh, for the website by talking to patients about your lived experience using uh, focus groups and uh, phone interviews. Uh, bringing patients and other stakeholders together to interpret the findings in a workshop to determine the content and, and features. And Mo just mentioned uh, uh, patients were very involved in, in the testing of, of the, uh, the website. This is just several examples. There are like many more where patients played like a leading role in the development of this comprehensive self-management e-tool. My Kidneys, My Health is truly uh, designed by patients for patients. And I believe this makes it stand out from other websites on the internet. And next slide, please. No, the one before that. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Uh, oh, sorry. Just get my notes here. I found that in my own experience that uh, websites on on CKD can be one dimensional, just dealing with one aspect of the disease. Information on emotional support, medication, and symptom management is limited, especially for the early stages. Oftentimes, uh, in, in, information about diet from multiple sites can be conflicting. Uh, My Kidneys, My Health is like one-stop shopping for li living well with kidney disease. I wish I had this website when I was first diagnosed in 2014. It would have saved me uh, like hours of like uh, going around the internet. Uh, this, this website has inf, 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 information on the disease itself, how your kidneys work, what causes CKD, how it's diagnosed, how it progresses to medication, symptoms, uh, mental and physical well-being, finances, work and school, travel, uh, and food and diet. All that um, a, a CKD patient, an early stage CKD patient needs to know. Next slide, please. Oh, here we go. This is one of my favorite features of the website. It answers the age old question, can I eat Brussels sprouts? <laughs> um, this is the, the food and diet uh, section. So. A lot of great diet tips, but it also has a um, an interactive food guide. So creating a food listing is easy. You just need to click on uh, add to my foods list on the food of your choice. And then you can view the list later and see how much salt, potassium and phosphorus that you are consuming. Each food also has a serving portion. And next slide, please. Another feature I'd like to highlight is the individualized uh, healthcare provider question list. Oftentimes when I'm doing research, I come across 
something that makes me say, hmm, I must remember to ask my doctor about, about that. But I always forget, when I get in the room with them, I always forget to ask them. Well, with my kidneys, my health, as patients uh, finish a section of the website, there are a list of questions that patients can add. Once their session is complete, patients can view and print the questions that they can take to their healthcare provider. So I could go on and on about the great features of My Kidneys, My Health, but I'll end by, by saying, I'm excited about the potential uh, for My Kidneys, My Health to have a positive in, in, impact. The whole reason why I got involved with CanSolve is to improve the lives of, of uh, people with kidney disease. I think this website goes a long way to achieving that. Thanks. I think we got a, a video now that we will play. What are the potential okay. symptoms of chronic kidney disease? Most people with higher kidney function do not have symptoms related to chronic kidney disease. Your kidneys can work well enough, even when kidney damage is present. Chronic kidney disease is silent. As your chronic kidney disease worsens, you may experience the following symptoms. Poor appetite, loss of concentration, itchy skin, where the itch feels bone deep, low energy levels, and lack of interest in everyday activities. For example, you may feel unusually tired after routine activities, such as taking a shower or grocery shopping. These symptoms will vary by the level of your kidney function and can be different for everyone. If you have ongoing symptoms, talk to your healthcare professional for suggestions and treatments. To learn more about symptoms and living well with chronic kidney disease, explore our website. Thanks, Dwight, and thanks for uh, getting the video and audio going there, um, Amanda. Um, and I just wanted to uh, just uh, acknowledge CanSolve um, and the support they've provided um, through the last uh, five going on six years of this multi-phased work and to the patient partners along with Dwight that we have on our team and also the numerous participants that uh, have been involved um, across Canada in all phases of this work. As we consider, we're going into our phase five of this work, which will be the implementation um, phase where we're looking at a strategic um, way of implementing uh, this in uh, settings such as general nephrology clinics and uh, primary care um, and the approach we're gonna take uh, to do that. But uh, thank you again for having us and we'll take questions. Thank you. Um, I'm just looking to see if there's uh, any questions out here. Are there any questions that from the uh, from the floor that have not been put on the uh, on the chat box? There's one for Nancy. Hmm? There's one for, there's a few in the chat box there. I'm not looking here. Okay, yeah, there's one here. Would you consider adding a feature to, uh, to let patients and their families contact each other, something like a support group or networking opportunity? Yeah, great question. Um, and that, that's very timely as um, working with uh, um, our team is working with looking at um, ideas around peer support um, with Dr. Megan Elliott and her work and with uh, KFOC. So looking at how we can um, enhance that peer support component either through this website or linking it um, through other agencies like KFOC and their work. I saw a question there from Melissa. Is there any plan to have an app for this? And so, um, good question, Melissa. When we um, looked at the platform to build this on um, a few years ago, patients and their um, care partners identified that they wanted it to be, um, be able to host features and interactions that could be um, used as a web-based tool, but also on a mobile device. So um, we don't have an app 
but it is um, functions on mobile devices as well. Um, not as well as uh, because we, can, we can't build it out yet, then those features get limited and the functionality gets limited um, for either limiting it on the web-based um, version or on the app version. So we kind of have to go with this kind of hybrid model um, to build out the platform for functionality. Hope that answers your question, Melissa. Um, right, Nancy has a question. Uh, does this website include access to coping skills, energy management, or how to talk to family, friends, etc.? Mm -hmm. Those are great topics, Nancy. Thanks for asking that question. Um, in terms of those key areas around um, coping skills, energy management, and how to talk to family and friends, not so much uh, around those. And uh, and the reason why is those did not come up directly through our focus groups um, with patients and care partners when we were looking at building the content of this website. But um, now as we've started disseminating this website out to the general public started in March during uh, World Kidney Days, um, we are hearing that there's other things that um, could be added um, to the website. So those are, those are um, key three areas that we should consider. One thing around that, how to talk to family and friends, there was more around how to communicate with your healthcare professional. And so that was where those um, tailored questions to build a question list to take to your healthcare professional, be it your dietitian, pharmacist, nephrologist, primary care physician, that came out, but not as much about how to talk to your family and, um, family and friends. Um, there's a few tips on the website, but not um, key to those three areas. So thanks for bringing that, Nancy, and we'll bring add that to our list of uh, content areas. Um, building out. Oh, I just had one comment. Um, I'm wondering if particularly the coping skills weren't included because that's not something many people are exposed to at all through the kidney world. And so they wouldn't have thought to bring it up because they didn't know that they could cope with energy. Um, and those kind of things. And I'm totally biased because I'm an OT and I think that those are areas that could be included. And I volunteer to help with that if, if that's something you wanna go to. But thank you, I think the site itself is very useful and I think that it will benefit a great number of people. So thank you to your entire team for all the hard work you've done. Yeah, thanks Nancy for bringing that up and uh, we can collaborate with uh, uh, Janine with uh, energy conservation and add that. Thank you. Um, thank you. Our uh, next one is from uh, where is that? Miss Melissa, we had that. Um, ah, from Leanne Stalker, now over the Kidney Foundation, other than CDTRP. Hello, Leanne. <laughs> um, are there plans to make this website bilingual or is it already bilingual? Great question, Leanne. It is not bilingual at this point, and we've had discussions um, with uh, KFOC in terms of what that would look like. Um, comments that have been brought back um, to us over the, in terms of the usability um, features um, were around language and comments from users, so patients and, and care partners um, identified a lot of them use, so our non, uh, like first English as a first language, brought up that they use Google Translate now as their um, as their um, go to tool. Um, not expecting websites to be in multilingual or multiple languages, but um, I think uh, French being um, the uh, uh, language, a secondary language here in Canada, that is an option. Um, and then to look at uh, the resources to do that and support that would be great. Does that answer your question? Yeah? Yes, it did. Thank you very much. Good. All right. From Karthik, the silent one. Uh, do I, would you, I, nice can, I can ask if you prefer, Hans. I don't mind. Yeah, well, why? That's a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> all right. I'll do that. Um, well, first of all, I think it was great. And, and I actually, just to reemphasize, it was like you didn't even need the sound and you can kind of understand things. And so I think. You know, from like a, a website and a, a site that's going to be like 
patient-friendly, user-friendly. I think that's fantastic. You know, bringing it, bringing it to sort of the trial side, one of the things that just struck me was, do you see maybe a chance of using this as a way of maybe even informing people who are, you know, navigating on the website, finding a way to link to then maybe trials that are happening in the area, just thinking about, um, you know, allowing uh, patients to have access to or information about studies that might be relevant or pertinent to them that they could either, you know, be involved with, participate in things like that. I was just trying to think about how to maybe, um, how this could maybe align with some work in patient-oriented research, clinical trials, et cetera. Great question and great comment uh, about that. And I don't know if I'd hand it back over to Ken Solve in terms of the, their, um, their uh, support in terms of linking uh, patients and patient participants to um, research studies, but it could be a possibility. Um, one thing to highlight that this is for early stage chronic kidney disease. So the idea around um, engaging those, those uh, that population in, uh, in clinical research and where as this, you know, most of the work we do um, is around end stage. So it's an interesting concept to highlight that to um, people with early stage chronic kidney disease and the opportunities out there for research. Sorry. One last question and then we're gonna have a quick break. One from Selena there. Right. Uh, he says, Karthik was the last question here. There's one from Selena that says, do you have any thoughts on how the website can be embedded in clinical care? Yeah, great question, uh, um, yeah. Selena. And so uh, that is a component or the key um, interest in our implementation study that we hope to um, start in uh, summer is understanding the bears and facilitators to different contextual settings. So in a general nephrology setting versus in the primary care setting, and also possibly in the community setting where we can see pharmacists playing a key role with um, um, interactions with patients with early stage chronic kidney disease. And so we hope to understand those barriers and facilitators and um, address strategies um, to, to help integrate into a clinical care setting um, as part of the clinical process, either through during um, early diagnosis or repetitive um, follow-ups in general NEF clinics to bring people on board to know that this is a resource for them, along with all the resources um, that are provided by KFOC. And on that, on our website, um, we do link um, and provide linkages, I should say, to KFOC as um, we try to tie and dovetail with um, the work they do. So thanks, Selena, for that question. I just saw there that uh, Heather um, put in um, about linking with um, Kidney Link and Record. Yeah, that's a great, great idea. So we'll follow up on that. Thank you. I think that was the last question uh, on here. Unless uh, Alicia has found something else. No? Um, in that case, I would like to uh, thank you very much, Dwight and Mo. And uh, I think it, I think personally, it's, it's very interesting, particularly for early stage when uh, you really are the loss. Uh, I mean, for me, that was a while ago, but it, it's, a, it's, a, uh, it's a period when you really don't know what's happening to you and how serious it is and how your life is going to change and all of those things. So having, having a, 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 a readily available website written in your language uh, is, uh, uh, is, is, a, is, a, is a very good idea. And from what I little I've seen here of the, of the website, I think that uh, they're very much on the right track. So uh, thank you very much for that. The, um, we will now go for, we'll now have a break, a little, uh, according to me, it's a five minute break that they call uh, a, a, a health break for those who are either afraid of words, words beginning with P, uh, or 
lunch. <laughs> At any rate, <laughs> it's uh, now one oh three, so we're actually a little bit early, only a few minutes. And I uh, expect everybody back uh, at their desks at uh, 1015, or I mean, at 115, right? At three. Uh, so if you come back, if you can be quick and make it back at 115, uh, we can carry on with the, the next. We're going to have a little timer here, too, so everybody moment. knows how much time they have. So it's going to be a little, there's going to be a little timer on the screen, so everybody will know how much time they have. Do we, do we want to say a bit earlier, though? Maybe just maybe instead of 10, 15, I guess 10, 10. I meant, I meant, yeah, 10, I meant 10. Yeah, specific, I said add three. So it's, uh, it's 115. Uh, by the time I finish talking, it'll be 120. But it, uh, <laughs> I think some people have already left already, so it's all good. I won't have a break and be back at uh, 115 or 120. Quick, quick break. Quick break. Okay, 115. Alicia's got the hammer out.
guess we can wait maybe just one more minute uh, for Hans. Should we just uh, get started? Hans, just wanted to see if you're, oh, there he is. Just make sure to unmute there, Hans, thanks. Yep. Didn't we say 115? We had, a, we had a five minute break. We were a little bit ahead of schedule. Yeah, I know, that's why I said 115, which was back on schedule. Well, we can always end a little early. Give people some time back in their day. Well, there. As long as Melissa here is ready to go. Yep, I'm ready. Okay. How many have we got? I think we can start. Will I go ahead? Hans, do you want to introduce uh, Melissa? We're going to start now? Yeah. Okay. Welcome. Okay. Welcome back from your uh, very short break. We're going to carry on now with uh, uh, our, our last uh, presentation of the day, uh, which is going to be presented by uh, Dr. Melissa Shore, who is a, a nephrology trainee at in the clinical investigation program, um, and is presenting her project, Diuretic Use in Patients with Residual Renal Function, function on Hemodialysis. Uh, the details of which you are about to hear from Melissa. Uh, proceed. I'm looking forward to hearing about this. Thanks, Han. Can we go to the next slide? Yeah. Um, so thank you for the introduction. As Han said, I'm Melissa. I'm a PGY6 nephrology and CIP uh, fellow at Western, and I'm a PhD candidate at McMaster University. Under the guidance of Amit Garg and Claire Harris, I'm exploring the diuretic use in patients with residual renal function on hemodialysis. Next slide. As many of us know, patients on dialysis live longer and have better quality of life if they maintain residual renal function. We certainly have more evidence of this in the peritoneal dialysis population than in the hemodialysis population. Uh, and patients on PD tend to hold on to their residual renal function longer than hemodialysis patients. A paper by Louise Moist describes a 65% decreased risk of losing your residual renal function on peritoneal dialysis compared to hemodialysis within the first year of therapy. We also know that loss of residual renal function is a bad thing. It's associated with left ventricular hypertrophy, uncontrolled hypertension, and increased erythropoietin requirements. In the peritoneal dialysis population, maintaining residual renal function not only improves control of LVH, blood pressure, and anemia, but it's been shown to improve uh, control of volume status, nutrition, inflammation, bone and mineral metabolism, and phosphate control. In the hemodialysis population, there are very few prospective studies and only a few randomized studies, none of which are based in Canada. From observational study, there is a suggestion that there's a mortality benefit in maintaining residual renal function in these patients as well. 
in a study of 114 prevalent hemodialysis patients in the United States, a urine output of anything greater than 100 cc's a day was associated with 65% less chance of dying in the subsequent two years of follow-up. Prospective observational studies also suggest that diuretic use could be beneficial and help preserve residual renal function. The DOP study includes over 16,000 hemodialysis and PD patients, and in this study, uh, diuretic use was associated with less interdialytic, interdialytic weight gain, less hyperkalemia, and better preservation of residual renal function. What we do not know is the natural history of residual renal function in new start hemodialysis patients, what the current prescribing practices are in Canada with regards to diuretics in hemodialysis patients, and what the impact of diuretic use in patients with residual renal function on hemodialysis is. Next slide. So what we aim to do is to answer these questions through a, ser a series of uh, studies. Uh, our first study is a narrative review that's coming to a close, and that's really summarizing the evidence that's out there um, surrounding this topic. We're then going to do an analysis of administrative data, a dose finding study, a feasibility trial, and ultimately a trial proper. And we aim to use a pragmatic embedded approach for these studies. And we're going to use the um, electronic platform for some aspects, including e-consent and information video and for collecting patient reported outcomes. And we've been very fortunate in that we've had patient partners involved from day one in the planning of all of these. Next slide. With regards to analyzing administrative data, we're going to be using um, the ICES databases in Ontario, which uh, Kristen Clemens uh, talked a little bit about. We're going to use this to evaluate the natural history of urine output in patients on hemodialysis, um, to assess uh, current prescribing practices um, of diuretic use in hemodialysis patients, as well as to analyze historical data on major adverse cardiac outcomes and all-cause mortality in hemodialysis patients to inform sample size and power calculations for our prospective trials. Next slide. The rationale for a dose finding study is that we really don't know what dose of Lasix is effective in the hemodialysis population, and we don't wanna have a trial that's negative simply because we've chosen the wrong dose. So this will be a single arm trial in enrolling about 20 patients. All patients who meet our inclusion criteria will be enrolled either to continue Lasix if they're already on it, or to start it if they're not. We've designed a dosing algorithm that increases the dose of Lasix each patient is on uh, every two weeks over a 10 week period. In terms of outcomes and data collection, we are not using a pragmatic approach for this study. We're going to collect blood work and patient symptoms uh, on a weekly basis and ask for 24 hour urine collections every two weeks throughout the dose finding trial. We will collect hemodialysis run sheets for every uh, run, but average values over each two week period on a particular drug dose. And really the goal of this study is to determine what dose or dose, dosing algorithm to use in our pilot and trial proper and to assess for any signals of harm. Next slide. This is just um, a little uh, flow diagram of our dosing algorithm. So essentially all patients that meet our inclusion criteria will be enrolled and started on Lasix 80 milligrams once daily. We chose a once daily dosing um, regimen really to just facilitate ease of use and improve compliance, especially in our hemodialysis patients who are away from their homes for many hours, three times a week. After two weeks of therapy, blood work, dialysis run sheets, and side effects will be assessed. Serious side effects um, will be kind of looked at in more detail. And if someone's having a, a serious side effect, we'll either keep them on that dose of Lasix, reduce the dose, or even consider stopping it. If there are no concerns, then we will increase the Lasix dose by 40 milligrams. Um, and leave the patients on that for the next two weeks and repeat the cycle three times, finally adding metolazone five milligrams daily until the study end. Next slide. Our pilot trial is really assessing feasibility of using this embedded pragmatic approach to answering this question. For this, we'll be assessing um, feasibility outcomes, clinical outcomes, as well as patient reported outcomes and side effects. With regards to feasibility, we want to assess our process, our ability to recruit patients, um, adherence, aiming for greater than 80% um, adherence to the, uh, the arm that patients are allocated to, and the integrity of our study protocol. In particular, if we end up using a dosing algorithm similar to the one that, we, that I just showed you, we want to know if there's going to be any major issues following that. 
In terms of resources, we want to assess the usefulness and appropriateness of our electronic approach in terms of our, our e-consent information video and our method for collecting patient reported outcomes. And in terms of management, because we are embedding this in routine care, we're asking our nurse practitioners and usual care physicians to be involved in recruiting and enrolling patients and kind of um, guiding them through the, the trial process. So we want to see if there's any real barriers to this and if we ultimately would need trial coordinators. In terms of clinical outcomes, we'll be comparing between group mean differences in the ultrafiltration rate, interdilytic weight gain, and intradilytic hypotension. And then a number of patient reported outcomes and side effects will also be assessed. And I described these um, in a couple of slides. Next slide. For both our pilot trial and our uh, trial proper, these will be the inclusion and exclusion criteria. So we're focusing on adult patients age 18 years or older. In Ontario, we'd like them to be Ontario drug benefit um, eligible. And this is really to facilitate um, monitoring adherence to, to Lasix um, to some degree. Uh, hemodialysis patients will be included only if they're on conventional in-center hemodialysis. Um, we'll include both uh, new start and uh, prevalent patients. New start meaning within the first 12 weeks of being on therapy and prevalent being at least uh, 12 weeks on therapy. We're defining residual renal function as self-reported -report, urine output of two cups a day if on a diuretic or one cup if not on a diuretic, or a 24-hour urine collection of greater than 250 cc's within six weeks of uh, enrollment. Life expectancy should be at least six months, and for our patient-reported outcomes, um, our participants would need access to a smartphone or device. In terms of exclusion criteria, uh, any allergy to furosemide or inability to take oral medications, any reason at the discretion of the nephrologist, um, patient expecting renal transplants in the next six months, so someone who's being worked up for a living uh, don a donation, or patients receiving dialysis as a palliative uh, therapy would not be included. Next slide. Our trial proper will be based largely on uh, the outcomes and success of our pilot trial, um, but essentially the primary outcome for this would be a composite of cardiovascular related death or major cardiovascular related hospitalization. Second outcomes will be determining what, a, what an effective dose or dosing algorithm um, of Lasix is in this population, the, what the rate of non-response to diuretics is, interdialytic weight gain, intradialytic hypotension, and ultrafiltration rate. Patient reported outcomes that I've re referred to but have not described will include itch, thirst, pill, pill burden, lightheadedness and dizziness, self-reported autotoxicity, muscle weakness and cramps, and urine output. And adverse events were mostly interested in hypokalemia and hypotension, but also hypomagnesemia, hypocalcemia, and self-reported autotoxicity. Next slide. So in summary, we're setting out to answer what we feel is a clinically and patient important question in a pragmatic way. Using this approach makes applying results to the real world straightforward, and we feel that this is an in intervention that could be quickly and widely adapted. Next slide. So I'd like to thank CNTN for this uh, very cool opportunity and especially Alicia Murdoch for all of her organizing and coordinating. And of course my uh, supervisors, Amit Garg and Claire Harris um, and then PSI for some funding. If anyone has questions, comments or feedback, it's all welcome. I'm very new to this. So the more feedback, the better. And my email is there if, if anyone wants to reach out. Thanks. Thank you, Melissa. Ah, questions are coming in. Um, it's just, here we go. Uh, from um, Gordon, I believe. No, Tyrone Gordon Harris. Yes, that's right. Okay. Uh, it's uh, it says, very interesting and relevant trial ideal idea. Um, questions from the dose finding pilot Are you aiming to find one dose for all? or seeing how the algorithm of dose escalation of diuretic is feasible or tolerated. Further, the once daily dose of Lasix is certainly a great for pill burden reduction, but is there a way that you can uh, study the feasibility of once versus multi-doses per day in your dose finding study? Certainly practice variation is present in Canada, but I rarely see one's daily dosing. 
Thanks, Aaron. Um, Really great questions. And the dosing for this trial has been a, a recurrent theme of discussion in our meetings. Um, I think realistically, we're going to end up with some sort of dose escalation algorithm, um, but I'm hoping that at least uh, running the dose finding trial will give us a, a better idea of like what dosing to even start at, or if there's any signal of harm at higher doses. Um, and, you know, I think real world application, how many of our patients even with CKD are on a stable dose, depending on their renal function. We don't really see that. There is really a lot of variability in response to Lasix. Um, so it'll be more of a finding what sort of um, tolerated dose escalation there is. The once daily dosing, I agree, is a bit um, unusual. Um, and we have kind of gone back and forth and it's not quite set in stone that we're gonna do a once daily. Um, but I know I, I realize most people are on at least twice daily, um, more just to make sure that people are actually getting their doses, especially with dialysis. It could be something that we do, you know, once da daily dosing on dialysis days, but uh, good thoughts. Sharon, any further questions for uh, Melissa on this one? <clears throat> okay. Um, from Catherine Clays. Beautiful set of linked and logical projects. I'm a little worried that once daily LASIKs may lead to intermittent effects of the, uh, of the fu fully real, sorry, uh, effects of the fluid medication and perhaps not fully realize the potential benefits. I see advantage of once daily dose. Uh, what proportion of patients with ESKD are you talking about twice daily medications? Thanks, Catherine. Um, totally agree with everything that you're saying, um, though we might just get kind of that intermittent effect and, and perhaps twice daily is the better route to go. Um, I would imagine, you know, I don't know offhand, but I would imagine that there's a, a majority of patients that are taking probably twice daily medications. I'm thinking even just beta blockers. Um, so it might be more, more feasible um, than I'm thinking it is. And maybe this is something that we bring to our patient partners to, to discuss and see if they feel that there's barriers to taking twice daily uh, Lasix, knowing that Lasix, you know, if it is increasing urine output and you're having to take it after dial, like after an evening shift or something, that might be a little challenging. But um, I'm appreciating the feedback on the dose, uh, the dosing algorithm, because that was something that we, we discussed a lot and continue to discuss a lot. Um, I'm also just seeing Han, sorry, uh, Karthik had a question right before uh, Catherine's, I'm not sure if you saw it, um, asking to recap how urine uh, volume will be measured, self-report, is there concern um, about the accuracy, accuracy of this both at once and with incremental uh, increases in dose? So totally, um, I think the, the um, stimulus to use self-reported is to, to make this pragmatic, but we're also going to use the, the less pragmatic approach in our dose binding studies where we have patients do self-reporting uh, urine outputs, but we're also doing every two week, um, 24 hour urine collections. So that can maybe even be used and maybe we'll explore that a bit more as um, uh, you know, a way of measuring whether or not self-reported urine output is an accurate way of measuring it. Uh, I am a little bit encouraged. I just briefly mentioned that one trial in the States that said even just uh, a urine output of greater than hundred cc's a day was um, associated with decreased mortality. So I think kind of any urine output is good urine output and, and just seeing what diuretic um, use does to that will be useful, I think. Yeah, no, I'll be just to sort of add a little bit more to it. Like, you know, I'll be honest, probably the part of this, even before anything that's of most interest is like, you know, how, how well, if you ask somebody, you know, how much urine do you make a day? And, oh, I make a, you know, a cup a day, or probably you're going to say a cup or a couple of cups or something, you know, understanding how, how well that actually, you know, compares to collections. I know there've been studies like this before in different populations, et cetera, but it's a neat way of doing it where you're looking at that embedded within then designing or sort of updating or optimizing your protocol. But it would be something I think that would be of interest, but at the same time, I do acknowledge like you're looking at changes in you know intradialytic weight gain and everything. So you are going to have some other very objective measures that may not always be tied to the Lasix-induced diuretic effect. Right. 
be compelling to see, you know, you're bumping up the dose and the intradiolytic weight gains are coming down. Like that, that is sort of a, a way of looking at this in, in a different kind of way. So I do applaud you for kind of having that aspect of this within the trial itself. That's cool. Yeah, maybe like an opportunity to validate that self-reported urine output, which will be interesting. Every time I ask a patient how much they pee, I always have that moment where I think to myself, do I have any idea how much I pee? <laughs> I'm like, not really. I don't know if I have today now, and I'm just getting a little bit nervous as I'm thinking about it. <laughs> but no, you're right. It's, uh, it's, it's a good question for sure. And yeah, it's cool that you're looking at it in that way. Thanks. Right. Uh, from Nancy, can you please explain what autotoxicity is? Well, uh, will you be checking to see how patients are coping with the diuretic beyond self-reported patient outcomes? Thanks, Nancy. Um, so uh, Lasix typically in really high doses, like greater than a gram a day um, and given kind of all at once can be associated with um, hearing loss. Um, it's really uncommon. Like we have a lot of patients on with chronic kidney disease, maybe even some patients who are with us here today who are on, you know, pretty impressive doses of, of Lasix on a daily basis and autotoxicity is really uncommon, but because it is like a pretty severe and known side effect, we just want to pay attention to if someone's starting to notice that their hearing has changed or they're getting some tinnitus or anything, just that they have that opportunity to, to mention that. Um, in terms of checking in and seeing how patients are coping with diuretics beyond self-reported patient outcomes. Um, I suppose the big one with that is gonna be our measure of, of blood pressure uh, during dialysis. And um, I suppose there's always that opportunity, but we haven't formalized it in our, in our, our uh, trial protocol. But because these patients are coming to dialysis three times a week, I think there's kind of that natural check-in with um, at least their, their nurse to see how they're doing. Um, I'm not sure if you have particular kind of questions about that. Um, you know, are you referring to like a pill burden or other side effects or worried that maybe our self-reported outcomes aren't encompassing everything that they could be experiencing? If you have feedback on that, that'd be appreciated. Well, thanks so much for asking because um, I come from a, a qualitative research background and I am very interested in the patient experience, uh, maybe not in huge detail, but knowing that, um, and I recognize the challenges of your study, but when we're looking at, for instance, the um, doing 24 hour urine collections every two weeks, if you've ever done one, they're a real pain in the ankle to be polite. And so <laughs> looking at how are they actually coping being in the study is the added, um, the benefit of urine output, which means they are having to get up more often and go to the bathroom more often, which physically is a good thing overall, but for them, it can be a real challenge when you're a dialysis patient and you're already tired and all those kind of things. So actually saying to them beyond the how you're doing, because unless the nursing staff are directed to say for your patients in this study, we're interested to know how they're coping with what's going on, you probably won't get much more than I'm okay from it. And it just gives you more detail. So if you're looking at adherence, what's happening? Are they more tired? What's happening? It'll just give you context to some of the information that you're going to get that is a little bit broader than the um, numbers. Thanks, Nancy. I really appreciate that. Um, I think just, uh, I'm not sure if I made it particularly clear, but we're going to do the two, two week urine collection exclusively in our dose finding trial. That wouldn't be something that we carry over into um, the trial proper or our feasibility trial for the exact reason that you said, that's just such a burden for patients to be doing that on a regular basis. So we're hoping that we'll get 20 patients who are willing to put up with that ridiculous request for 10 weeks and then put an end to that. Cause that's, it is, it's a, it's a big ask of our patients. If it's in your budget, you might consider compensating them in some way. Just an acknowledgement that says we recognize how hard this is and we're very grateful to you. Uh, it's something to think idea. about anyway. But great thank idea, you, I love that. Okay, thanks, Nancy. Um, next question is uh, <coughs> David Collis. Hans, I can ask it. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, um, hey, sorry, I may have missed this earlier. Just a question about like the timing of the diuretic relative to dialysis and if there's any consideration of like UF could cause potentially diuretic breaking and decreased impact. 
Right. I think we just said, because we're just using this like once daily approach that it would be like, you know, if you're on the evening shift of dialysis, you would take it kind of first thing in the morning. If you're a morning patient, you wouldn't take it until the evening or later in the day. I know evening diuretics is not ideal, um, but kind of working around timing that way. I'm not sure if that's answering what you're asking. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Got it. Thanks. And then, yeah, Nancy, sorry. I see your last uh, comment about compensation there, which you, you mentioned. So thank you. Um, that seems to be so far all I've got. If anybody has other questions, oh. Uh, I think there's another one there. I'm at ease. Um, okay. Uh, do you want to ask the question yourself? I'm at ease. Yes, sure. Hi. Um, I was just wondering if you, um, yeah, what is the plan to do for people who are already on a diuretic? Um, I don't remember it being an inclusion or exclusion criteria. And because here, the, at least in, in Quebec and in the hospital I've worked around Quebec, um, pretty much everyone who, like the first thing we do if we have a struggle with ultrafiltration and need to um, increase the amount of liquid the patient is removing every week is to put them on a diuretic and titrate up up to 250 to twice a day. So I would say most of our patients who still have a urinary output um, are on diuretic. Thank you. Um, and that's great. Like, that's great to know that you've already got this in practice. Um, and I'd be interested to know if you have found anyone struggles with the twice daily dosing of Lasix and dialysis. Um, um, well, no, I, most of them are already on medication twice a day. So it's not really they are before dialysis. So they just keep, keep going. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Um, and yeah, sorry, it was a very briefly mentioned in one line uh, that patients who are, so if, so for the dose, Finding study. If you're already on a diuretic, we'll just keep you on it. And by a diuretic, I mean furosemide. Um, and then for our feasibility and our trial proper, you'll be randomized to either um, like start or continue or stop or not start. So if you're on the diuretic, you'll still be randomized to either continue it or not um, for, our, for our proper and our, our feasibility. And would you expect to run into some problems if you, well, that's in a long time for your proper trial, but um, into patients who, let's say, they've been randomized to stopping the diuretic and then they're starting to have ultrafiltration issues and not meeting their target weight in dialysis? Um, you, yeah. Yeah. So I think there will have to be kind of that opportunity for, for patients to you know, stop participating in the trial or, you know, I think in, in one of our exclusion criteria was um, if there's any reason at the discretion of the nephrologist that a patient shouldn't be uh, included in the trial. And I, you know, I, I thought of like really severe pulmonary hypertension, for example, or someone who, you know, exactly what you're saying has had tons of problem with, with ultrafiltration and is on a whopping dose of Lasix already. I think, you know, probably most reasonable Nephrologists would say, you know, I don't, I can't imagine this person being off diuretics is a wise idea. So, and I think that, you know, including that in the pragmatic approach makes a lot of sense because in the real world, that's probably how we would react to. So I think that's, that's how we would manage that. Thank you. All right. Do you want to uh, make your own comment? Oh, I was just saying that's something pretty simple. We do like, it gets pretty complicated because the more you potentially have a greater urine output, the more you may drink, actually. So it's a complex intervention in truth. And listen, uh, as identified knows as well. And also, because this is an open label trial, people are not going to be blinded to their diuretic dose. You know, the implications of that on patient report outcomes, of course, is an consideration versus the uh, more objective outcomes. Okay, just your. Uh... No, I don't see anyone else coming in. Any further questions? Going once, twice, three times. Thank well, you again for all the feedback and, and this opportunity. Sorry, both. 
Is my Zoom misbehaving? No, nope, you're all good. Go ahead, Hans. I didn't thank Melissa. Thank you, Go Melissa. Ahead. <laughs> <laughs> Alicia, I think it's over to you. Um, I'll just pass it over to Karthik to give some yeah. final words. Perfect. I, yeah, I, I just um, uh, thank you. First, I'll say thank you to all the presenters. Uh, it was really interesting. I think we saw three very different um, you know, questions, three different developments of those questions. You know, one, one that's a sort of more of a feasibility trial, uh, website development, how patients were involved very early on, and how to sort of, the last one, how to sort of stage a question in a variety of different ways to ultimately get to the major trial at the end. So I think that was fantastic. Um, I think very important for everybody, this recording will be available on our website. And I want to emphasize to the presenters too, because there may have been other comments or thoughts that were embedded that you might have forgotten that you might want to hear just as you're further developing um, you know, these protocols or for those that have developed them maybe that are already thinking about the next steps. I do want to add to you, um, you know, that we have really encouraged everyone to submit uh, their, their proposals, protocols directly to us at the CNTN so that we can provide a level of scientific review and then subsequently endorsement. And, um, you know, Alicia, correct me if I'm wrong, but we're going to be reaching out uh, certainly to the presenters today to offer that opportunity. There's no, you have to do it or arm twisting or anything, but to provide you with the opportunity to maybe do that. And, um, you know, what's nice about that is that you do get uh, some of the, you know, breadth of scientific rigor that we have embedded within our group. And very importantly, you also get some really, really valuable uh, patient opinions and patient input. And I can tell you that um, in the proposals that we have received, very often it's been the patient input that's actually been, you know, quite helpful in really formulating these questions, developing these ideas and taking them to that next step. Um, which is the ultimate goal of getting funded and then implementing the study. Uh, so thank you very much. Uh, don't forget the key messages. Visit our website. Uh, please do follow us on Twitter. I'm so bad at Twitter, but follow us on it anyway, <laughs> which is much better than me. Um, thank you, Hans, for um, moderating everything today. And uh, if you have any questions, please email Alicia. And uh, we'll hopefully try to put another one of these on. So if you know people who have questions that want to present and get some feedback, um, please do encourage them to do it. We'll, we'll be looking at some future date about this and we'll make sure we let everybody know. So uh, thanks, this is, this is great. This is a tough time right now and to have that much participation uh, really um, uh, hats off to everybody. So thank you.